Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. In the last video, we talked about moles and Avogadro's number, and we learned how to convert between grams, AMUs, the number of molecules in a sample, and the number of moles. In this video, we'll use that knowledge to perform the most common calculations that chemists ever do. If you learn to master the concepts in only one video in this course, make it this one. So suppose you decide to perform a reaction in which you combine sodium bicarbonate and sulfuric acid. This reaction produces bubbles of carbon dioxide. And one question you might want to answer is, how much carbon dioxide will it produce? This kind of question is the most common one that chemists ask. For a given amount of reactant, how much product will we get? Let's make this question more specific. The reactants are sodium bicarbonate and sulfuric acid, and the products are sodium sulfate, water, and carbon dioxide. If we start with 1.00 grams of sodium bicarbonate, how much CO2 will we get? The first thing you should do is make sure that the chemical reaction is balanced. As we'll see in a few minutes, we'll use the coefficients in the balanced reaction during our calculation, so if the reaction isn't balanced, we'll end up making a mistake in our calculation. In this case, the reaction is not balanced. There's one sulfur, one carbon, and seven oxygens on each side of the reaction, but the sodium and hydrogens are unbalanced. We learned how to balance reactions a couple of videos ago. If you've forgotten how, you should go back and review that video now. This one's a little harder to balance than the other ones that we looked at, so let's spend a minute working it out. When there are several different elements that need balancing, as in this case, sometimes people have trouble knowing where to start. A good rule of thumb is, start by balancing elements that only appear in one compound on each side of the reaction. In this case, the sodium and hydrogen are both unbalanced, but the sodium only appears in one place on each side of the reaction, while the hydrogen appears in two places on the left side. So we'll start by balancing the sodium. There's one on the left side and two on the right, so we'll put a two in front of the sodium. But now that we did that, we also changed the number of hydrogens, carbons, and oxygens. The carbons and oxygens used to be balanced, but not anymore. So now our sodium and sulfur are balanced, but not the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But the advice I gave you before is still true. Start by balancing things that only appear in one place on each side of the reaction. In this case, carbon is only in one molecule on each side, so let's balance that one. There are two carbons on the left, one for each sodium bicarbonate molecule, and one on the right, so we'll put a two in front of the carbon dioxide. If we check the elements, we see that sodium, carbon, and sulfur all balance but the hydrogen and oxygen don't. Which of those should be balanced next? Well, the hydrogen appears in two places on the left and one on the right, but the oxygen is in every single molecule in this reaction, so the hydrogen will definitely be easier. Let's balance that one. There are four hydrogens on the left, one for each sodium bicarbonate molecule and two in the sulfuric acid, and there are two on the right side of the equation. So we need to put a two in front of the water. Now that we've done that, we find that everything's balanced. There are two sodiums on each side of the reaction, four hydrogens, two carbons, 10 oxygens, and one sulfur. Now we can finally start our calculation. We have 1.00 grams of sodium bicarbonate, and we want to know the mass of CO2 that we'll get. In the last video, I told you that it's easiest to work with moles instead of with grams. So a good first step is always to change the data you're given into moles. That's still true. In fact, here's a good guide to start you solving most problems like this one. First, start with whatever data you're given, which will usually be in grams. Step one is to convert that into moles. Next, we'll convert that into moles of our target compound, the one we're trying to solve for. And finally, we'll convert those moles back into grams to get our answer. 
Notice that instead of calling them the reactant and the product, I call them the known and the target. That's because this method works no matter whether the molecules you start and end with are reactants or products. You can use this starting and ending with any molecule in your reaction on either side. So let's use this method on our problem. We start with the grams of the known compound. In our case, we're starting with 1.00 grams of sodium bicarbonate. Next, we'll convert that into moles. We learned how to do that in the last video. We need to know how much one mole of sodium bicarbonate weighs, which we get by using the atomic masses on the periodic table. When we do that, we find out that one mole of sodium bicarbonate weighs 84.0057 grams. So which part of that conversion factor should go in the numerator and which should go in the denominator? Remember, we're converting to moles, so we want the grams of sodium bicarbonate to cancel out. That means we'll put the grams in the denominator and the moles on top. Next, we'll convert to the moles of our target, CO2. This is where our balanced reaction comes in. If you look at the reaction, the coefficients tell you that two moles of sodium bicarbonate produce two moles of CO2. So that's our conversion factor. We want the moles of sodium bicarbonate to cancel out, so it will go in the denominator. Finally, we'll convert from moles of CO2 to grams. Here again, we do this by using masses from the periodic table. We find out that CO2 weighs 44.0095 grams. If you check the units, you'll see that they all drop out except for grams of CO2, which is what we're looking for. That gives us a final answer of 0.524 grams of CO2. Notice that I already rounded this to the correct number of significant figures. If you forgot how to do that, you should refresh your memory by checking the previous video. If you can master problems like this one, you'll have one of the most useful skills that a chemist has in their toolbox. But there's one important complication that often pops up in questions like this. In most chemical reactions, you have more than one reactant. For example, in our problem, we had two, sodium bicarbonate and sulfuric acid. We had 1.00 grams of sodium bicarbonate, but what if there wasn't enough sulfuric acid present for it to react with? In that case, the sulfuric acid would have run out before the sodium bicarbonate had all reacted, and we wouldn't have gotten as much CO2. This situation is similar to playing a game of musical chairs. If you're less than 80 years old, you may never have played this game, but the idea is that a group of people walk in a circle around a bunch of chairs, and when the music stops, everyone jumps into the closest chair. But there are fewer chairs than there are people so some people don't get a seat, and they lose the game. In this case, the number of people in chairs is limited by the smaller number of chairs. We could also imagine the opposite situation, where there are more chairs than people. In that case, everyone gets to sit, and there are some chairs left over. This time, the number of people in chairs isn't limited by how many chairs there are, it's limited by the smaller number of people. The same thing happens in chemical reactions. Suppose we have this reaction, where the gas methane, CH4, reacts with oxygen, and the products are CO2 and water. Watch what happens as this reaction occurs. The CH4 and oxygen combine, and eventually we run out of oxygen. But there are still a few methane molecules left over. If we had had more oxygen, we would have gotten a little more of our products out of the reaction. In this situation, we say that the oxygen was the limiting reactant because it ran out first and limited the amount of product that we could get. There was still some methane left over, so we say that methane is the excess reactant. Notice that when you're deciding which one was the limiting reactant, the important thing was how many molecules of each there are. 
the masses didn't matter. It was the number of moles that mattered. Whenever you're deciding which reactant is a limiting reactant, remember that you can't tell this by just looking at how many grams of each you had. You need to work out the moles. So let's try that for the reaction we looked at earlier. We start with 1.00 grams of sodium bicarbonate. And this time, let's say we have 0.981 grams of sulfuric acid. Unlike the previous example, we now have a specific amount of both reactants, so we have to worry about which of them is going to run out first. In other words, which one is the limiting reactant? And as I said, we can't tell that just by looking at the masses of each. The mass of sulfuric acid is slightly smaller, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it will run out first. So let's try calculating how much CO2 we'll get based on each of the two different reactants. We already did that by starting with sodium bicarbonate, and here's that calculation again. We found that we'd get 0.524 grams of CO2. But now let's run that calculation again, this time starting with the sulfuric acid. Remember the method that we use. We start with the mass of sulfuric acid we're given, 0.981 grams. In step one, we convert that to moles of sulfuric acid using masses from the periodic table. Be sure to set it up so that the units will cancel out. Next, we'll convert from moles of sulfuric acid to moles of CO2 using the coefficients from the balanced reaction. There's one mole of H2SO4 for every two moles of CO2. So that'll be our conversion factor. We want the moles of sulfuric acid to drop out, so the one goes in the denominator. And finally, we convert from moles of CO2 to grams, again using masses from the periodic table. All of our units cancel out except for grams of CO2, and we get an answer of 0 0.880 grams of CO2. The important thing to notice here is that this is different than the answer we got when we started with sodium bicarbonate. With sodium bicarbonate, we only got 0.524 grams. This tells us there's not enough sodium bicarbonate to react with all of the sulfuric acid. The sodium bicarbonate is going to run out first and we'll only get 0.524 grams of CO2 and we'll have a little extra sulfuric acid left over. In other words, the sodium bicarbonate is the limiting reactant, and the sulfuric acid is the excess reactant. As you can see, problems with limiting reactants are more time-consuming than regular problems, because you end up doing the calculation twice, one for each reactant, in order to determine which one gives you less of the product. With a little practice, you'll be able to do problems like that more quickly, but you should try to get that practice in before the next test so that you won't have to spend as much time working out problems like that one when you take the test. Let's try another question. In the last example, we found out that sodium bicarbonate was the limiting reactant and sulfuric acid was the excess reactant. One question we might want to know is how much sulfuric acid was still left over after the reaction was finished. This question might seem a bit tricky. How can we know how much sulfuric acid didn't react? But another way of looking at it is how much sulfuric acid did get used in the reaction. And that's a problem we do know how to answer. We'll follow the same method we used before. We want to know the grams of our known. Since sodium bicarbonate was the limiting reactant, we know we use all of it in our reaction. So we start with 1.00 grams of sodium bicarbonate. In reactions involving a limiting reactant, this will usually be where you start, with the mass of the limiting reactant, if you know which one it is. Now in step one, we'll convert that to moles of sodium bicarbonate. And in step two, we'll convert to moles of our target, the thing that we want to know about. In our case, it's sulfuric acid. There's one mole of sulfuric acid 
for every two moles of sodium bicarbonate. Since we want moles of sodium bicarbonate to drop out, we put the two in the denominator and the one up top. Finally, we convert to grams of sulfuric acid using masses from the periodic table. This gives us a result of 0 0.584 grams. So that's how much sulfuric acid got used in our reaction. But the question asked, how much was still left over? To get that, we just subtract the 0 0.584 grams that we used from the amount we started with. That gives us 0 0.397 grams left over. Let's try one more limiting reactant problem. How many grams of copper metal would we get if we combine 1.00 grams of copper 2 chloride and 1.00 grams of aluminum metal? If we look at the reaction, we can see that it isn't balanced, so we'll need to balance it before we can begin our calculation. The copper and aluminum are balanced, so we just need to balance the chlorines. There's two on the left side and three on the right. You can see that we can get six chlorines on each side if we put a coefficient of three on the copper two chloride and a coefficient of two on the aluminum chloride. Now that we've done that, the chlorines are balanced, and we just need to balance the copper and the aluminum. Once we do that, our reaction is balanced. We'll solve this problem the same way that we solved the earlier problem with limiting reactants. We'll use the same three-step method we've been using, and we'll run the calculation twice, once starting with the copper two chloride, and once with the aluminum. So, we start with 1.00 grams of copper 2 chloride in the first calculation and 1.00 grams of aluminum metal in the other calculation. In step 1, we'll convert both of these into moles. In step 2, we'll convert those moles into moles of copper. In the first calculation, we're converting from copper 2 chloride to copper metal, so our coefficients are 3 and 3. In the second calculation, we're converting aluminum to copper metal, so our coefficients in that case are 2 and 3. Remember to be careful about which coefficient goes on each side of the fraction. You want the reactant to cancel out, so it goes in the denominator. Finally, we convert our moles of copper into grams. We find out that, starting with copper 2 chloride, gives us 0 0.473 grams of copper, and starting with aluminum gives us 3.53 grams. That means the copper 2 chloride is the limiting reactant, and we'll only get 0 0.473 grams of copper from the reaction. The aluminum is the excess reactant, so we'll have a little bit of it left over when the reaction is finished. There's one more topic that I want to mention before we're done for today. We just saw that, in the last reaction, we could get 0 0.473 grams of copper. But suppose we actually do the reaction and find out that we really only get 0 0.350 grams. There are a lot of reasons why this might happen. Maybe we spilled some of our chemicals, or maybe there was an impurity in them. Maybe the reaction was too hot or too cold, or maybe it had the wrong pH. You'll find out in lab that it's very hard to actually get 100% of what you could have gotten in most reactions. We can express the actual amount that we get in an experiment by using a figure called the percent yield. The percent yield is just the mass you actually get in your experiment divided by the theoretical amount you could have gotten had everything gone perfectly. We then multiply it by 100 in order to turn it into a percentage. In our case, we actually got 0 0.350 grams, so that's what goes in our numerator. And our calculation earlier showed that we could theoretically have gotten 0 0.473 grams. When we do this calculation, we get 74.0%, so that's our percent yield. <laughs>
If we really had gotten 0.473 grams, then that would have gone in the numerator, and we would have gotten a 100% yield. Well, that's it for this video. As I said earlier, the calculations you learned about today are some of the most useful and important ones in the entire course. So please feel free to ask if you have any questions about them, and please come see me if you got stuck. We'll practice these a lot in class and on the homework. Until next time, have a good week!